So you guys seem to really want to hear me talk about the YouTube channel What If Alt Hist. Critiquing the ideas of a 20 year old is not exactly what I envisioned for this YouTube channel, but it's given me my most viewed video in like two years. So I guess we'll give the people more of what they want. Luckily, in the four months since my first video critiquing that very successful geopolitics and history channel, young Mr. Lynch has given me a lot to talk about. He's taken a big jump in coherence and production values. Last time I complained about how scattershot a lot of his videos could be, but recently he's been turning his considerable and growing powers towards much tighter arguments. Unfortunately, these arguments remain fundamentally flawed in ways that I remember from my own intellectual development. In a lot of ways, it's getting worse. The new, slicker, stock footage account having what if alt hist seems to be devolving into a sort of Fox News for nerds. Let me be clear, what if alt hist is no trumper, nor has he fallen into the orbit of the alt-right trolls. Dodging those bullets is pretty impressive for a kid who has now lived like half his life as a right-leaning public figure. It shows wisdom far beyond his years. But he's fallen for something else that I usually associate with white men three times his age. What if alt hist seems to be developing into an anti-anti-trumper? The thing social justice people don't understand is that the more they push, the more they create the backlash that will kill them. Anti-anti-Trump is the philosophy that holds that, yes, of course, Donald Trump was gross, but you have to understand it was leftist excesses that brought him to power. It's the left wing that's the real problem. It's frustrating to see what if alt hist fall into this default baby boomer position because he's actually getting a lot better at seeing and presenting the realities that contradict this ideology. My favorite recent what if alt hist video has got to be A Historian Explains Gen Z, where he does an impressive job laying out the crappy circumstances his generation finds itself in. In 1950, it would take over two years of average income to buy a house. Now we're at over 20. In real terms, standard of living has declined precipitously since the 70s. The cost of education has gone up 20 times since 1970, and per capita spending on healthcare has gone up seven times since 1970. The example I've given earlier that I think is still powerful is that in the 1980s, Homer Simpson was considered a lower middle class loser for holding a steady job with a stay at home wife, three kids, and the ability to go on vacation regularly. That standard of living is impossible for basically any young people today. For the majority of this Gen Z video, What If Alt Hist provides a compelling portrait of how bad things have become. It's a rousing description of some of the factors that convinced me that it was time to finally abandon my youthful faith in Ronald Reagan in the aftermath of the 2016 US presidential election. But what if Altist hasn't broken with the old religion yet, so he can't provide any real solutions to the problems he's described so well? He briefly complains about the deficit, says, well, things might end up working out all right anyway, and concludes with a bunch of whining about social justice movements. He implies that the economic despair and alienation he movingly describes is inevitable. The driving factor behind this isn't any particular group like the right or left, the banks, or ethnic minorities, but instead macroeconomic trends that are affecting the whole world and that we've seen dozens of times across history before. This sounds smart, but it's a standard elite cop-out. It's the sort of thing I used to believe, but I can now see that it's deeply wrong. None of this was inevitable. The grim economic picture he paints isn't the result of the way economies just work, it's the result of political choices. We didn't have to to let private equity take over all our hospitals and drive up prices. The two biggest healthcare reforms of the century so far didn't have to have the main goal of making insurance companies richer. We didn't have to let local zoning boards shut down the countrywide home building industry. We didn't have to ship all our factories to China. These were all political choices with economic consequences. If we had made different choices, then things would have been different. We can, looking forward, possibly make different political choices that could have better results. But what if alt his ideology prohibits him from seeing that, prohibits him from talking about the real possibilities? 
Despite all his focus on how irritating social justice movements are, I think What If Alt Hist is missing the point of these movements entirely. The most Fox News thing about his work is the model of US politics he seems to accept. I don't think it oversimplifies things too much to say that he sees an ongoing battle between left and right for the soul of the American people or whatever, but that's not what's going on at all. The truth is that what we are all experiencing right now is the death of a 40-year-old political model. It's a very similar experience to what the world went through in the 1970s. I spoke at length about this a couple years back. Ronald Reagan, for better and for worse, defined his era and the three decades that followed it. As far as 20th century presidents go, probably only FDR was more influential. And arguably, thanks to the end of the Cold War, Reagan's ideas have gone a lot farther than FDR's ever did. FDR came to power during the Great Depression, at a time when capitalism was seen by many as having failed. FDR saved capitalism from communism and fascism by massively increasing government involvement. The balance he created between the public and private sectors has been characterized as managerial capitalism, focused on mass production and government fine-tuning of the relationship between capital and labor. During this period, government produced marvels like interstate highways and the trip to the moon. The experts, public and private, were creating an affluent society, and we were all supposed to do our part and enjoy it. Reagan defined himself in opposition to all that. He wanted free trade and free markets. Reagan heralded the return of the entrepreneur and the mass disruption of big government and even some big businesses. Capital had to be free and government had to get out of the way of the job creators. Creative destruction was the order of the day and things like labor unions and national borders were inconvenient obstacles to be crushed. A tremendous amount of energy has been expended on arguing over which of these approaches was right and which of these approaches was wrong. At my advanced age, I've come to the conclusion that they were both right, and they were both wrong. FDR and Reagan both presented a set of ideological and legal solutions to the problems that beset their respective eras. Both sets of solutions worked really well for a period of time. You can measure the success of these mental models by how impossible they were to avoid. At every U.S. election, the two parties always claim to be very different animals. Democrats and Republicans in different eras advocate slightly different mixes of policies, but they don't really dissent from the overall mood of the times. Dwight Eisenhower, the first post-FDR Republican, worked for the government for most of his career and created the interstate highway system, one of the biggest government projects ever. Nixon talked a good anti-establishment game, but he was an enthusiastic user of the tools of government founding the Environmental Protection Agency, and going so far as to fix prices and wages economy-wide in 1971. Republicans are going to hate hearing this, but the Clintons were both Reaganites. Welfare reform, financial deregulation, balanced budgets, you name it. If it was in the GOP platform, the Clintons tried it. Like Nixon, Obama talked a very different game, but he followed Reagan just as much as Nixon followed FDR. Obamacare, his supposedly socialist healthcare program, was a product of the very right-wing Heritage Foundation think tank. The stocks of most major healthcare companies are up by four to 500% since Obamacare was passed. Are you beginning to see what social justice is really about? At the elite level, anyway? The Democratic Party shift towards political correctness and identity politics in the 1990s wasn't about fighting Republicans. It was a marketing strategy to cover up the fact that the Democrats completely agreed with Republicans and wanted to join them in turning everything in the U.S. government and economy over to the Fortune 500. Social justice is like abortion and guns, controversial issues that are used to cover up the fact that the two main parties don't disagree on anything fundamental. In the 80s and 90s, the Reagan consensus worked well for the country as a whole. For the past two decades, it has allowed both parties to rob the American public blind while we have been distracted by a steadily mounting series of Washington, D.C. created crises. Sure, social justice ideology does occasionally get out of hand and ruin some people's lives. So do the dumb gun and abortion laws that the Republican Party keeps pushing. It's all just the price of doing business here at the ass end of the Reagan era, and business is good. The companies that own the news are desperate to keep the gravy train going by preserving the fiction that our political parties have fundamental disagreements of any kind. 
making social justice movements seem like some kind of alien enemy rather than a normal part of centuries of US development is a key part of the Fox News playbook, a way to obscure what's really going on. Unfortunately, what if Altist, as perceptive as he is, seems to be buying into this marketing scheme. The foxification of what if Altist isn't just leading to bad arguments, it's leading to public humiliation. Three weeks ago, what if Altist had what I hesitate to call a debate with Vouch, a popular left-wing YouTuber. In prepping for this video, I finally watched the second half of this debate, and I was surprised. They were largely talking past each other, but in the second half of the debate, I think What If Altist looked like the clear winner. He had a better idea of what he was talking about, and he got less flustered. The same cannot be said for the first half of the debate, where What If Altist felt obligated to defend some dumb Fox News dogma that he had built a bad video around. And Martin Luther King is currently the biggest, you know, figure that's cited when talking about historical civil rights in the modern Black Lives Matter movement. So there is a definite continuous ideological trend from A to B to C. And I feel like the only reason you would deny that fact is because you like what the abolitionists did, but you don't like what BLM activists do today. And you have to explain that disconnect by somehow separating these extremely well-connected movements. Bro. How many books on American intellectual history have you read? Give me some titles. Give me some book <laughs> titles to back up what you're saying. So that's the point at which I stopped watching this debate three weeks ago out of sheer embarrassment for what if all hissed. It's not just the pathetic, I read more books than you argument. It's the fact that it was delivered in a format and in a conversation when what if all had already demonstrated his complete ignorance on the topic. The abolitionists were built out of the radical Republican agenda, which was a subset of the Republican Party that existed mostly in the upper tier of northern states. And their platforms were, in effect, um, trying to settle the, settle the Western frontier. Uh, they were very pro-capitalist, very This pro is an obfuscation. The first name that comes to mind on abolition is William Lloyd Garrison. Anti-slavery sentiments dated back before the founding, of course, but Garrison is where most textbooks start describing the final form of the abolitionist movement. His newspaper, The Liberator, founded in 1831, pushed abolition onto the national agenda, and he was widely hated for it, north and south. He was an infamous figure. It's easy to see why Garrison doesn't feature in the books What If Alt Hist Reads, because he was the very definition of a radical social justice warrior, advocating civil disobedience, proclaiming a deep loathing of the US Constitution, and apparently even claiming that Frederick Douglass wasn't a good enough advocate for African Americans. You can see this kind of behavior on Twitter today. It's really as American as apple pie. The Republican Party, what if Altis' supposed inventor of abolition, wasn't even founded until 1854. The closest historical parallel would probably be Obama and Clinton's adoption of gay marriage advocacy after it became a majority viewpoint in US opinion polls. Even Abraham Lincoln wasn't openly for abolition until the third year of the Civil War. And I don't believe radical Republican became a meaningful designation until the war itself, a full 30 years after Garrison's popularization of abolition as a cause. The abolitionists were built out of the radical Republican agenda, which was a subset of the Republican Party that existed mostly in the upper tier of northern states. Bro. How many books on American intellectual history have you read? Give me some titles. Give me some book titles to back up what you're saying. Trying to win an argument by claiming that your opponent hasn't done the reading is always unattractive. Making that claim when you clearly don't know the first fucking thing about the topic at hand is appalling. What if Altist was put in this ridiculous position on a topic he clearly doesn't know much about because of ideology? He wisely dodged the bullets of Trumpism and the alt-right. Why is he now nailing himself to the mast of Fox News social justice whining? Is the endorsement of figures like Sebastian Gorka really all that valuable? The thing that gets me the most is that what if Altist really didn't need to take the Tim Pool path? Tim Pool of the Ridiculous Beanie went from Occupy Wall Street to churning out a dumber version of Fox News on YouTube for financial reasons. And it was a great business choice for him. But what if Altist already had a huge and growing audience before his recent hard turn towards ideology? 
Could it be that he actually believes this nonsense? Why don't we close with some of What If Altist's own words? Decadence comes in many forms, but on all the fundamental bases, it's an inability to come to terms with the reality that's staring straight at you, and instead preferring to hide behind some culturally constructed vision of the world. What if Altis seems like a really smart kid? When he finally lets go of the rest of his culturally constructed view of the world, I bet he'll start making some really great stuff. All right, I could probably say more on this topic, but you're going to have to force me to do it. In order for me to make a third What If Alt Hist video, I'm going to need this video and the first video I made on What If Alt Hist to get over 50,000 views each. It's a pretty tall order. Next time, we'll be heading back to Yemen. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe and click the bell next to the subscribe button if you'd like an update whenever I post a new video. Thanks.